gets into about keeping it as a good home for humanity. That's where, what we are going to, uh, to discuss. I need to give you uh, two housekeeping uh, recommendations. First, if you require textual interpretation, uh, there's a speech-to-text tool on the website that you can use in 23 languages. So use that uh, if you need it, because indeed we are going uh, to have a lot spoken in English, uh, maybe in a few other languages, but I can fully understand and not everyone is comfortable with that. And then we are going to try to have interactivity. And of course, with such big uh, attendance, it's not always easy. And for that, we are going to use the Slido tool. There's links, uh, there's QR codes at the entrance, but also uh, on, the, on the website. So use it to ask your questions. The interesting thing about Slido is that we can see uh, what questions are most popular, what are the ones that really uh, need to be, uh, to be asked first. But without further ado, in order to, uh, uh, to uh, stay on schedule, I would like to welcome and give the floor to President Roberta Metzola. Roberta is a young president of the European Parliament. She is actually only the third woman to be president of this parliament, and she is a forward thinker, no doubt. It was not a hard job for me to convince her to help us, because of course without the full engagement of the Parliament as an institution, the 20 MEPs who organized this, uh, this, uh, this conference would not have succeeded. This is really thanks to her, her commitment. We do not belong to the same political family, neither do I with uh, Ursula von der Leyen. Yet, uh, we are demonstrating here that we can work together for a common cause. So, Roberta, the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you very much, dear Philip, dear President of the European Commission, dear Ursula, dear friends. You know, Philip uh, was saying it's not often that we have young people in this room. I first entered this room as a young pro European political activist over 20 years ago. I remember looking to my left, looking to my right, and said, I don't know these young people around me come from a different country, I might have different views, different points of ideas, but I knew one thing, that I wanted to leave this room never forgetting the experience that I got from looking at the potential of democracy, of being active towards a country joining the European Union and once entering, making sure that that promise and hope that the European Union gave could be materialized. So whenever I enter this room, Philip, I don't think of all the difficult plenaries we have. I also think of the most amazing moments, such as when President Zelensky addressed this room. But I think of that first time that I entered this room. And I would like you, as an appeal, to tell you that use these three days, if you don't know the person to your left or to your right, to make friends and hold those memories in order to make Europe a better place. So I'd like to welcome you here to the European Parliament. It's not always so full on a Monday morning. I'd like to see it like this more often. <laughs> I'd like you to, to feel at most at home in our House of European Democracy. This was one of the first events, if not the first event, I committed to as soon as I was elected President of the European Parliament. Because you know, Philip, you have always been future-oriented and someone who has always understood, and this is rare, that our responsibility as politicians goes beyond the short-termism of our mandates. So today's conference is as apt as it is important. Our world is rapidly changing and right now we are dealing with the effects of a global pandemic, war, on our continent, an energy crisis, inflation, all against the backdrop of a climate crisis. Now, these crises are existential to Europe and to our world. Russia's invasion of Ukraine, it highlighted the cracks in our energy systems and in our security strategy. It has reinforced the necessity of diversifying our energy supply. 
of turning our focus towards renewables and sustainable sources of energy, on cooperating further on the issues that are fundamental to our Europe. When we look back a little bit more than a year, recent geopolitical events, these are events whose consequences immediately shook us. But they also showed us the power of unprecedented unity. When it comes down to it, the European Union can enact a massive amount of change in a short time. We have recently turned to law the Green Deal ambition to make the EU climate neutral by 2015. We are making sure that Europe is on track to be the world's first climate neutral continent. And this is not only about going green for green's sake. It is about growth. It is about jobs and security and ensuring that our continent is on a firm foothold for the next generation to inherit it. That is what sustainability is. It is growth that we have to deliver for our citizens now as much for our future generations. Now, as with the world rapidly changes, we need to change with it. We policymakers have to adapt our strategies and set the regulatory framework right for rapid change. We must deliver reforms to showcase the economy and the environment as the same side of the same coin. These are inextricably linked to, secure, to the security of our union. Now, what is our challenge now as we look forward over the next difficult months ahead? It is to ensure that no one falls through the cracks or is left behind. And this means that we need to talk to all our citizens. This means that when somebody is worried about whether they can pay their bills or keep their job, that we have the answers to that with bold ambition and understanding. Now, after the economic crisis some years ago, we saw more and more people look away from Europe. This cannot happen again in a world that has become more unpredictable and more dangerous. Now, we have to be careful not to throw away all the painful lessons learned about European economic and fiscal policies. And this is about pushing the concept of better Europe that matches the need of more Europe. At the cost of repeating myself, funds are finite, debts must be paid back, and the only way we are able to do that is if we are able to grow our economies sustainably. And the legislation that we create here, that we vote here, is about creating new jobs, new sectors and new industries, giving us a competitive edge. And I say this with responsibility. We can both save our planet and protect our ability to make a living and support the world around us. Just a few weeks ago, we adopted, and this was hard to negotiate between different committees in this House, different political groups, bringing together colleagues that I'm proud to sit with today. Overwhelmingly, the Social Climate Fund. We know that when we look at our societies and the pressure that they are feeling, then we have to deliver with funds that address and cushion the impact that our families, our businesses, our citizens, those who feel marginalized, those who feel far away from this room over here, want us to deliver. And that means that we have a long way to go, but we can only be successful in our fight to deal with this crisis if we are in it together. That means bringing all of us on board. My appeal to you would be to be open, to be as frank and discuss with each other, to come together and identify solutions that we need to take with us as we convince people to vote for this European Parliament next year, as we look at different countries and say what can be done here, how can we reach across the table and offer a better Europe. 
I think the future of Europe is full of unbridled possibility that we must seize. And Europe, as we have seen, we must and should continue to lead by example. So thank you very much for having me here. Thank you very much for the possibility of sharing a few thoughts at the beginning of the conference. It's always different at the beginning when it, than it is at the end. I would like to be here actually in three days to see what the conclusions are. But hold us to account, keep us responsible, and we will be together to deliver. Thank you very much. Enjoy. It. Well, President von der Leyen, liebe Ursula, I will never forget actually the first time we met. It was in this building. You came into the, the room saying, well, you know, a week ago I had no idea that I would be bombarded candidate president of the European Commission. That was, I think, July 2019. And already then you promised us a European Green Deal. And you know, I thought I knew you, I, I followed your career in Germany, and I never heard you speaking about these issues, and I felt, well, is this serious? Fast forward to December 2019, and then comes the communication about the European Green Deal. And if you think it's about climate, then read it again. It's about planetary boundaries. Almost everything is in it, actually. And let me be honest, I was surprised and positively surprised. Now, if it weren't for you, I don't think we would have a European Green Deal. And it's all the more remarkable that you come from the biggest European political family, the European People's Party, yet you decided to go for it. And indeed, well, you are not God Almighty, you cannot just dictate. You have to work with co-legislators, and we need to find majorities to bring the idea of a European Green Deal forward, but probably this initiative it's, is the most relevant or the, most, the more ambitious thing that the European Union has done so far to try and fit within the planetary boundary. So for that, thank you already, and the floor is yours. Good morning, and thank you very much, dear Roberta. Thank you very much, dear Philippe. Honorable members, ladies and gentlemen, indeed, if we look back, a little over 50 years ago, the Club of Rome and a group of MIT researchers published the Limits of Growth report. It mapped the interaction between population growth, the economy, and the environment. And it came 50 years ago to a drastic conclusion. Stop economic and population growth, or else our planet will not cope. And as you know, this report has sparked a long controversy, for instance, about the role of new technology in the countering the climate change. But instead of prolonging these debates, I want today to concentrate on one point, and that is a point that the report got right beyond any doubt. And that is the clear message that a growth model centered on fossil fuels is simply obsolete. This assessment has been confirmed time and again. The recent IPCC report is just the latest reminder that we need to decarbonize our economies as quickly as possible. And this is exactly why we put forward our European Green Deal. Building a 21st century clean energy, circular economy, is one of the most significant economic challenges for our times. The European Green Deal is not only our plan to fight climate change and become the first climate neutral continent, it is also our new European growth model for a prosperous, responsible and resilient economy. It is our blueprint for a systematic modernization of Europe's industry. Because in the long run, 
Only a sustainable economy can be a strong economy. Only a sustainable economy has the resources to invest in healthier and in a fairer tomorrow. Only a sustainable economy empowers us to reach the social targets we set ourselves at the Gothenburg and Porto Social Summit. Only a sustainable economy generates the means to accelerate research and development for clean technologies. So, 50 years ago, the Club of Rome could not completely envisage, for example, the potential of green hydrogen. It could not envisage that we might drive this kind of electric cars of today. Or it might be able not to see the future as we would have, for example, with batteries where we recycle 95% of lithium, nickel, and cobalt. It's not the daily procedure today, but we're able to do it. But already 50 years ago, the Limit to Growth report acknowledged that while fossil fuel-based growth was unbearable for the planet, humanity could devise, and I quote, a different growth model, model that is sustainable far into the future, end of quote. This is the mission that drives us today, and this is the spirit of the European Green Deal. We do not have to start from scratch. Our compass in this endeavor are the long-standing values, the true values, if you get it right, of the European social market economy. Our social market economy was never exclusively about economic growth. It always was about human development. It never had the sole goal of market efficiency and liberalization. To the contrary, the social market economy functions in the interest of the worker and the community. It opens opportunities also to set very clear limits. It rewards performance, but also guarantees protection for the big risks in life. Beyond growth, it focuses on public goods, such as health care, education and skills, workers' rights, personal security, civic engagement, and governance, good governance. Our social economy, market economy, if you get it right, encourages everyone to excel, but it also takes care of our fragility as human beings. The values of the social market economy have driven us since the beginning of this Commission's mandate. Within the European Green Deal, we have always strived to reconcile jobs with the protection of the most fragile people of our society. Technological innovation with climate neutrality. And we have stayed true to this approach even as new crises disrupted our everyday lives. First, when the pandemic hit us. Our recovery plan, Next Generation EU, has focused not only on restarting our economic activities after the lockdowns, but also on transforming our economic model with a push to decarbonizing industries, energy and transport, with an emphasis on digital skills and digital infrastructure, with new investments for schools and hospitals, beyond growth, Next Generation EU takes care of the next generation's future. And then, last year, when Russian tanks rolled into Ukraine and the Kremlin rolled out its energy blackmail against us, it was a tough year. It did shake us to the core. But not only did we guarantee Europe's energy security, there were no blackouts and protected vulnerable households and companies with a solidarity contribution from big energy providers. 
We also accelerated massively the transition to clean energy. And for the very first time in history, in 2022, we generated more electricity from sun and wind than we ever did from gas and oil. While the CO2 emissions globally rose by 1%, in the European Union during this year 2022, we managed to cut emissions by minus 2.5% despite the war. So this is the living proof it is doable. You can cut emissions and have a prosperous life. It is doable. André Gide, a French writer and Nobel Prize winner, once said, one does not discover new lands without having the courage to lose sight of the old shores. End of quote. And I have to look back once. In the 1970s, just one year after the Limits of Growth report was published, the big oil crisis began. Back then, our predecessors chose to stick to the old shores, not to lose sight of them. They did not change their growth paradigm, but relied on oil. And the following generations have paid the price. We also experience massive crisis. We are choosing a different path. We are choosing to discover new lands. It's not trivial. Today we are leaving the fossil fuel growth model behind us. But the new lands are still blurred, but they are visible. We can reach them. We know that our children's future depends not only on GDP indicators, but on the foundations of the world we built for them. It was Robert Kennedy, back in the 1960s, who famously said, and I quote, that GDP measures everything except that which makes life worthwhile, the health of our children and the joy of their play. And I'm sure, had he given his speech today, Kennedy would have included the sound of birdsong and the joy of breathing clean air. Today, on a very fundamental level, we understand Kennedy's wisdom. The economic growth is not an end in itself. That growth must not destroy its own foundations. That growth must serve people and future generations. This is exactly what you will discuss today and the next two days. So thank you for inviting me, and I wish you a very good conference. Thanks a lot. Well, so it's now 51 years, actually, since the report of the Club of Rome. I remember during my first term, uh, I visited the European Central Bank, and uh, I had the opportunity to address about 200 uh, 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 staff members of the ECB, and I started with that, with the, the uh, Limits to Growth report. And back then, it was more like 40 years old. And the first question I got, it was not a question, it was a remark. A young guy 
saying, but Mr. Lambert, it's okay, they said that 40 years ago, but we're still there, right? The economy is still functioning. And he gave me the impression of someone, you know, fa falling from a skyscraper and 10 meters of the, from the ground, well, so far so good, right? Uh, and indeed, there's reason to be, yeah, angry that it took 50 years for these ideas, actually for the science, to permeate policy making. I can tell you when I started organizing the first edition of this conference five years ago, the reception I got from Ursula von der Leyen's predecessor was a bit abrasive, to be honest. Uh, and indeed, only one member of the Commission back then uh, showed up. It was Margrethe Vestia uh, from Denmark. She was the only one willing to engage, even though she did not have really a background uh, in these ideas. Today is quite uh, different. But so it's also, as I said at the opening, with a sense of joy that I welcome you, but also with a sense of gravity. Because the clock has been ticking, and if you look, and I think of my, my kids, aged between 27 and 35, uh, if you look rationally at the world around us, uh, there's many reasons to believe it's already too late. Yet, accepting that it is too late is a form of self-fulfilling prophecy. If we believe that it's too late, then we will forgive, well, forget any effort and then the fatal uh, uh, end is certain. The only way to seize the chance of giving a future to humanity is to believe, to believe that indeed we can find a way, we can find a way to, uh, to bring all societies within the planetary boundaries. And I'm very glad that indeed during these three days what we are going to try to achieve is to infuse this debate in European policymaking. That's what we are really trying to do. And uh, you go here from the, the, the Commission President, and the Commission is very important because it's a source of legislation in Europe that these ideas have, have begun to permeate at the very top of the, uh, of the European Commission. And that's good because, indeed, if you look at the 27 heads of states and governments, I would challenge you to name me one. I could maybe name one, but just one. Who would have demanded a Green Deal? from the European Commission, that, who would have demanded uh, a project, a transformational project such, such as this one. It was not on demand of the member states. It was really an initiative from the European institutions. And it's good that so far uh, we have been able to book progress, but as we make progress, we meet more resistance. Because indeed, the current system has winners. It has winners, and these will not willingly surrender their profits. So it's a struggle, but it's first a struggle for hearts and minds. You know, it's about winning the narrative, winning the public debate. And that's what we are going to try to do. So I will invite the three speakers of our first panel. Sandrine, where are you? Ah, you're there already. <laughs> Come on. So as I speak, stuff happens in my back. So we have Sandrine Dixon de Clef, president, co-president of the Club of Rome. It was fitting that indeed it was, it was fitting that we would have uh, uh, Sandrine here because indeed it all started with the limits to growth report. And that was really prescient. But yeah, prescient, but actually the science was there. So they, 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 they spent time and energy to try to bring it together, but no one can say that the facts were not there. Then we will have Jason Hickel from the uh, Autonomous University of Barcelona, one of the many uh, scientists who will uh, give us food for thought in, uh, in these three days, because indeed what we want is fact-based policies. That's what we need. And then Adelaide Charlier. Adelaide, you were uh, one of the, the, the youngest leaders, climate leaders here in Belgium on the, on the footsteps of the, 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 the climate strike uh, started in, uh, in, in Sweden. And, and frankly, you have impressed me ever since. Uh, because it's not only the anger that drives you, it's the hope. It's the hope 
that indeed we can make it happen. We are alive and we want to stay alive. And indeed, we need that kind of energy to move forward. So I, I will give you all three in that order the floor uh, for 10 minutes or so, and then we will try to have an interaction first between you and then uh, hopefully with the floor. Uh, so again, use, uh, use Slido. Uh, last remark, we have tried, and actually it was not that difficult, we have tried to have gender balanced panels all along the conference. I do believe that indeed there's something to be said about, I would say, the masculine dimension of the current exploitative paradigm. And I do believe that, uh, I do believe that if we want to get out of this paradigm, probably, probably we'll, we will need to make it more feminine. Thank you. Well, what a wonderful opening. I find it quite uncanny, actually, when uh, President of the European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen, decides to read a speech that uh, mentions not only the limits to growth, but probably half of what I wanted to give to you this morning. <laughs> I could actually step down, but I think it demonstrates the nature of this incredible house, and it demonstrates the nature of the possibility of bringing together a multi-party solution to move beyond growth. So I do want to start by giving credit to Ursula von der Leyen, as you have, Philippe, for her exemplary leadership and with the support of this House, she has steered Europe through a global pandemic, towards a European green and social deal, and also the response to an ongoing war in Ukraine. We could think about the despair and the pain of the Ukraine today, but today I want to bring you some hope. We won't be able to end the rolling crises, but we can build more resilient societies better able to deal with shocks and stresses. And we can build societies that support transformation, not reject it. The first glimmer of hope is the very fact that we are here today for the next three days in the European Parliament talking about the root cause of the poly crisis, the obsession with growth. This is genuine leadership, and I applaud you, Philippe, and your colleagues for their vision to host this conference. Let's make sure, though, we translate all these speeches into action when we leave these hallways on Wednesday. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it is not difficult. The needed policies to put Europe further on the path towards a more sustainable and inclusive society and economy have their anchors in the EU's own history, traditions, initiatives, and legislation. Notably, these anchors are found in the Treaty on the European Union, the European Commission's own strategic dashboards, and the European Green Deal. It shows that by keeping the overarching vision for an economic model that underpins the European Green and Social Deal and delivers greater prosperity, the European institutions can and should set the tone for a future policy. Our goal now is to bring the member states and citizens on this journey. But before I talk more about growth, I want to say a few words about democracy in the same way that President Metsolo indicated how important Europe's democracy is. It is now very obvious that the idea of growth and democracy are inextricably linked. The discussion today comes one year ahead of big elections in major democracies, including the United States, the UK, and of course the European Union. In these elections, every party from left to right will talk about economic growth. They will all have their solutions to drive growth. The media will challenge them on whether these solutions will actually foster growth. But the growth narrative is never changed. We are all here to change that. We are all here to show that the emperor or the empress has no clothes. with economic growth is clearly failing the majority of people. Let's be clear, democracies are under threat. Social tensions are rising. Citizens simply don't believe the political elites are on their side. 
We are seeing a slide back from democracy at the very moment we need strong democracies that are able to take historic decisions. Giant leaps to transform economies away from luxury carbon and biosphere consumption. I will make the case that we can have strong democracies or we can continue our dangerous obsession with growth. But we can't have both. The center cannot hold. The most important thing we can do right now is invest in social cohesion. At the heart of that is human well-being, economic security and ecological resistance, not growth. Last year, indeed, was the 50th anniversary of our seminal report at the Club of Rome, The Limits to Growth. And at an event to commemorate that, one of the key authors, Dennis Meadows, described the moment when he presented to a similar group of people, not as many youth, I must say, an assembly of politicians and business leaders. And he said he was extremely nervous. This is 1972. He thought he was wasting their time. He thought he was going to spend an hour telling them the things they already knew that exponential growth on a finite planet will have catastrophic consequences for people and planet. Dennis said he was simply astounded that this appeared news to his audience. Yet here we are, 50 years on, and somehow this continues to be news, not a reality. The limits to growth warned about overshoot and collapse in the 21st century. The scenarios indicated that the human footprint could end up exceeding the carrying capacity of planet Earth. But what has happened since? Today, 50 years later, it is a historical fact that political leaders chose to follow the most destructive scenarios of the limits to growth. The human footprint has continued to grow and it has now been established scientifically that we have exceeded six of nine planetary boundaries. Most worrying is climate. Yet the limits to growth science is still challenged. There is an assumption that technology will fix the problem. The only technology that will fix this at this time is a time machine to go back 50 years. It's not technology we need. This obsession with technology. We need to change the economic paradigm and we need political leadership. So last year, myself and my colleagues published a new analysis, Earth for All, a survival guide for humanity. We looked at this transformation head on and we said, in one single human lifetime, we must transform. We explored just two scenarios, which we call too little too late, right now, business as usual, and the giant leap. To develop the scenarios, we brought together a transformational economics commission of economists and thought leaders from across the globe, and a novel system dynamics model called Earth for All. One of the novelties of the model is that we included two indices, a well-being index and a social tension index. The too little too late scenario is essentially the road to the world is on now. Incremental progress on climate change, poverty, gender empowerment, and food systems change. It is a world of regional rivalries. It could have been called the road to hell. In our scenario, we will cross the two degree climate limit within a few decades. And we know that there is a very high risk of crossing multiple tipping points including the loss of the Greenland ice sheets and critical parts of Antarctica. In this scenario, business as usual, we destabilize the planet for all future generations to clean up the mess. The wealth is distributed much like today, with the richest on Earth taking almost all the gains. And unsurprisingly, this, reads, this leads to rising social tensions. We conclude that rising social tensions will reduce the capacity of society to act rationally and strongly in the face of adversity, just like today. This is not stability, people. This is not security. That was the first scenario. The second scenario is the giant leap. We wanted to identify a small set of actions, a minimum viable product, to reach as many sustainable development goals in Europe's vision of a social and green region. We wanted to take a systems approach to explore if we can achieve an acceptable level of well-being for the global majority on a finite planet. 
We conclude that nothing less than the following five extraordinary turnarounds are needed to have well-being for all while respecting planetary boundaries. Ending poverty, addressing gross inequality, achieving full gender equity, transforming the food system and the way we eat, transitioning to clean energy and efficient energy. We argue that these five extraordinary turnarounds in the set of economic reforms that will drive them form the basis of a well-being economy. It is not a blueprint, but more of a guide for systemic transformation. In this scenario, poverty ends a generation earlier than too little too late. We see gender empowerment in one generation, not ten. We see a switch to healthier plant-based diets. There is still meat consumption, but at sustainable levels. And we have carbon dioxide emissions every decade to reach net zero by 2050. The economic model everywhere is circular, regenerative, and efficient. Material consumption of unsustainable resources is reined in, fossil energy phased out, and we see a significant redistribution of wealth. This is achieved through more government expenditure on health and education. Coming back to what the President said, what is most essential, progressive taxation, more empowered workers through stronger unions and more representation on boards, full gender equity in leadership positions. But most importantly, in this scenario, we dramatically see social tensions fall and well-being rise. In this scenario, we introduce a universal basic dividend operating like a universal basic income, with dividends coming to all people, sharing the wealth of the global commons and public goods. Who's taking the wealth now? It is not properly redistributed. This is not utopic. This is what is fair and just and what a society in transformation is all about. Why do we think this is important? We know the giant leap will be disruptive. We're talking about a complete shakeup. This is everything, everywhere, all at once. It will create shocks. But if it is to succeed, then we must bring the majority of people along the journey. It must be fair, and it must provide genuine hope for a better future for the majority. There are a huge array of ideas that can drive the giant leap scenario. We don't see it as either or. We will need to adopt several economic models at once. Mission economies are perfectly compatible with donut economics, which is compatible with post-growth thinking. We will need green growth. We need growth in renewables, in regenerative farming. The least developed nations, of course, need to grow, but they need to grow differently. We need to work in tandem to enhance a different type of growth that fosters an economy that services people, planet, and prosperity at the same time. Not windfall profits, for example, on the back of energy, transport, or food poverty. We can see more countries openly discussing well-being economies. We already have five well-being economies in New Zealand, Iceland, Wales, Scotland, and Finland. And in recent weeks, the Irish President Michael Higgins challenged the country's obsession with growth. And we also see Canada and Costa Rica and so many other countries that are saying enough is enough. A growth economy, an extractive economy is not servicing my country, my people, this planet, our home. So ladies and gentlemen, this is a message to politicians campaigning on an economic growth platform. People don't want economic growth. They want economic security. They want ecological stability. They want government investment in their future and economic and financial systems that foster their well-being. If we need growth, it is a growth in social cohesion to empower democratic governments to act. That is the priority. The opportunity for the EU is huge. This is equivalent to a new Grand Marshall Plan. Within a single generation, the EU could achieve energy security, food security, and economic security. How do we achieve it? We need leadership from the EU to shift the economic system from one that is grounded in power and profit and patriarchy to one that is anchored in people, planet, and prosperity. Let us make sure that this becomes our future, all of us, and let us make sure that this becomes our reality together. Thank you.
you. Thank you, Sandrine. Well, obviously, obviously, you can uh, write some electoral programs, right? Well, I'm afraid I won't run next year, but, uh, but at least I hope it will infuse a public debate. Jason, over to you. Okay, thank you so much, and thank you for the very powerful and compelling speech. <clears throat> it's an honor for me to be here, uh, and thank you all for joining us, and thank you for the invitations uh, from the political parties. Um, I, I want to use my time with you to speak directly and practically to the extraordinary impasse that we clearly face as a civilization. We are at 1.2 degrees of global warming, and already the effects are clearly disastrous. Devastating planetary changes are playing out before us in real time. It is critically important that we make every effort to limit global warming to as close to 1.5 degrees as possible in line with the Paris Agreement. Scientists warn that pushing beyond this level towards two degrees is likely to trigger several major tipping points in the Earth system, and beyond this level, we will not be able to adapt. Yes, over the past decade, the EU has reduced its emissions. Some politicians have hailed this as evidence of green growth. But remember, when it comes to climate mitigation, what matters is speed. We must reduce emissions fast enough to stay within fair shares of the carbon budget for 1.5 degrees. For high-income countries, this is extremely challenging because they have very high levels of energy use, uh, and high energy use makes sufficiently rapid decarbonization very difficult to achieve. The EU is not on track to meet its Paris obligations. Not even close. At existing rates of mitigation, it will take several hundred years to cut emissions to zero. Even if the Green Deal brings everyone to the speed of the best performing countries, Denmark and the Netherlands, the EU will still blow its fair share of the carbon budget many times over. There's nothing green about this. It's a recipe for disaster. Much faster mitigation is needed. And climate is not the only crisis that we face. We're also overshooting five other planetary boundaries, including staggering rates of biodiversity loss, driven mainly by excess material use in the world economy. And here again, it's the high-income countries which have disproportionately high levels of material use which are overwhelmingly responsible for driving this crisis. What's more, the constant hunt for capitalist growth in the EU and other high-income economies relies on a constant plunder of goods and resources and labor from the global south. Input-output data shows that consumption in rich countries, uh, about half of all the material consumption in rich countries is net appropriated from the global south through unequal exchange. This drains poorer countries of wealth that could be used for development. It colonizes their lands. It produces global inequality. And it means the social and ecological costs of growth are externalized to vulnerable communities. This arrangement is wildly destructive and wildly unjust. The science is very clear. Rich countries must substantially reduce their use of energy and materials so that we can decarbonize fast enough uh, to stay under 1.5 degrees, so that we can reverse other forms of ecological breakdown, and to release the global south from the grip of neocolonial extraction. But this brings us to a paradox. Europe has extremely high levels of energy and material use, vastly overshooting planetary boundaries, and yet nonetheless still fails to meet many basic human needs. 40 million people cannot access nutritious food and cannot heat their homes. 95 million people face the risk of poverty. Tens of millions more cannot access decent housing. Why? It's because our economic system is fundamentally undemocratic. Our productive capacities are controlled by capital and mobilized around what is profitable to capital rather than what is necessary for human well-being and ecology. So 
So we end up with perverse forms of production, SUVs and fast fashion and fossil fuels and advertising instead of public transit, nutritious food, renewable energy, affordable housing. Our economic system fails in both ecological and social terms. So we face a double challenge. We need to transition to an economy that meets human needs and achieves social progress, while also substantially reducing energy and material use. <laughs> Some of this can be achieved through efficiency improvements, yes, and we should embrace the power of technological change. But we also know that this is not enough in and of itself. In a growth-oriented economy, gains from efficiency are diminished by the scale effects of ever-increasing production. If we are to overcome this problem and achieve our ecological goals, we need to transition to a post-growth economy and reorganize production around well-being and ecology. The first step is clear. We must abandon GDP growth as an objective. Simon Kuznets, the man who invented the GDP metric himself, warned that it should never be used as a measure of economic and social progress. It does not distinguish between what is good and what is harmful, and it does not account for social and ecological costs. We urgently need alternative indicators, but please do not walk away from this conference believing that this is all that needs to be done. If you are speeding toward a cliff, it is not enough to simply fiddle with a speedometer in your car. You have to deal with the underlying problem. Think about it this way. The dominant assumption in economics right now is that every industry must increase production every year regardless of how destructive it is and regardless of whether or not we actually need it. This is an irrational way to run an economy at the best of times. In the middle of an ecological emergency, it is clearly madness. Instead, we need to determine democratically what kinds of production we need to be doing and what kinds of production are clearly destructive and should be scaled down. This focuses the mind. Empirical research shows that the single most powerful way to improve well-being and social outcomes is to expand and decommodify universal public services. And by, <laughs> and by this I mean healthcare and education, yes, but also housing, public transit, energy, water, internet, nutritious food for all. High quality universal services should be a core objective of EU policy. Let us mobilize our productive forces to ensure that everyone can access what is necessary to live a decent life. In addition, we must invest in ambitious public works programs to build renewable energy, improve public transit, insulate homes, install efficient appliances, restore ecosystems. These are urgent, socially necessary tasks, and we cannot just wait around for capital to decide they are worth doing. We must mobilize to do them directly and fast, harnessing the power of public finance and industrial policy. Such a program can and should also include a job guarantee, empowering people to train and participate in the most important collective projects of our generation, doing dignified, meaningful, socially valuable work with workplace democracy and living wages. Think about the power of this approach. It allows us to achieve ecological objectives, but it also abolishes unemployment, something that growth never does. It abolishes economic security, which growth never does. It ensures good lives for all, regardless of fluctuations, and liberates us from growth imperatives and stabilizes the economy. Now, as we improve and secure the socially necessary sectors, the social foundation, we also need to scale down socially less necessary forms of production. Fossil fuels are the obvious one here. We need binding targets to wind this industry down. But, but we also need to reduce production of private jets, SUVs, commercial airlines, mansions, industrial beef, fast fashion, advertising, arms, cruise ships. There are huge chunks of our economy that are mostly organized around capital accumulation and are wasteful and destructive and totally irrelevant to human well-being. We can also ban the practice of planned obsolescence and introduce policy to extend product lifespans. If our products last twice as long, we will need half as many. Finally, we urgently need to cut the purchasing power of the rich. 
using basic, sensible policy tools such as wealth taxes and maximum income ratios. Recent research... Recent research shows that millionaires alone are on track to burn 72% of the remaining carbon budget for 1.5 degrees. This is an egregious assault on humanity and the living world, and none of us should accept it. We need to realize that it is irrational and unjust for us to continue devoting our energy and resources to supporting an overconsuming elite in the middle of a climate emergency. Policies like these would dramatically reduce energy and material use, allowing us to achieve rapid decarbonization while at the same time improving social outcomes. And if we find that our society requires less labor to produce the things that we need, we can shorten the working week, give people more free time, and share necessary labor more evenly, thus permanently preventing any unemployment. Unemployment is an artificial scarcity, and it can be abolished. Is it affordable? Yes. By definition, yes. As Keynes pointed out, anything we can actually do, we can afford. In terms of productive, uh, productive capacity, we can pay for it. And when it comes to productive capacity, we have far more than enough. Deploying public finances and industrial policy simply shifts this capacity away from wasteful production and elite accumulation to achieve democratically ratified social and ecological objectives. Some will say this sounds utopian, but the policies I've mentioned here happen to be extremely popular. Universal public services, a public job guarantee, more equality, an economy focused on well-being and ecology rather than growth. Polls and surveys show strong majority support for these ideas, and official citizens' assemblies in several European countries have called for precisely this kind of transition. A post-growth deal along these lines can be a popular and feasible political agenda. But Europe is not an island. Addressing our global crises requires that all countries succeed or none of us do. Governments in the global south also need the freedom to mobilize their own production around human needs and ecological objectives, rather than servicing consumption and accumulation in the global north. This requires... This requires reversing IMF structural adjustment programs, cancelling unpayable debts, and ending unequal exchange. None of this will happen on its own. It will require a major political struggle against those who profit so prodigiously from the status quo. To get there, we must build alliances between environmentalists and labor movements and other progressive political formations. This is not a time for timid responses, tweaking around the edges of an obviously failing system. This is a time for courage. Is there hope? Yes. But our hope can only ever be as strong as our struggle. So build the struggle. Focus on the future we need. A just and ecological economy for the 21st century. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. You described uh, our current system as undemocratic, and indeed, if democracy is the government of the people, by the people, for the people, then indeed uh, you, can, uh, you can say that it fails uh, to meet the, at least the last test, uh, because indeed those who are profiting from public policy uh, are not uh, the, the general public, they're, they're, they're the citizens, but the happy few. Um, but I would argue that the event that we are holding in this place uh, is maybe held in the right place. Because indeed this parliament has power. And the best proof of the power of this parliament is the amount of lobbying that we are getting. That's the best proof that indeed we have the power to shape our future. If we didn't, they wouldn't spend zillions trying to influence us. So what is really missing is the collective will to use this power 
uh, to do well. Now, of course, we don't have all the competencies, and especially what you said about taxation is still pretty much member state competence. But at least I would argue that there's more progressive views about taxation here than there are in many uh, national uh, parliaments. But Adelaide, you have been trying to influence us uh, for years now, together with the, the Youth for Climate movement. Tell us, uh, what are the next steps and how do you see the thing going? quite impressive for me to speak after such eminent speakers that could be uh, my professors or even my parents. <laughs> 70 years ago, Europe was built on a strong desire for peace, believing that it was necessary to develop creative efforts with the dangers that threatened it. Later, when the architects of Europe dis decided to institu institutionalize the Union, they signed a promise to defend freedom principle, democracy, human rights, and the rule of law for all European citizens. They committed to implement, implement policies ensuring parallel progress of its economy, its social cohesion, and its environmental protection. The principle of Europe brought the hope for a new era of all those who had experienced the horror of war. They carried the dream that solidarity between nations would protect them from becoming the victims of human self-destruction. A dream that tomorrow will be better than yesterday, based on the belief that industrial and economical progress will guarantee happiness for most of us. A dream that controlling nature will ensure a wealthy development to societies. For years, economic growth has been beneficial and brought prosperity to Europe. It created jobs, reduced poverty, stimulated innovation, mechanization, and productivity. While, it is, while there is indeed a relationship between growth and human progress, be, beyond a certain point, and Europe has long passed this point, this relationship is broken. Beyond this point, economic growth is harmful. It damages the planet and human communities, increases inequalities, and generates stress and depression. The path towards peace was mapped out in the 20th century as a highway aligning economic growth, social equality, welfare, and exploitation of people and nature. Less than a century later, the belief of growth towards the infinite is now facing nightmares. Nightmares of droughts, melting glaciers, floods, loss of biodiversity, loss of ecosystems, non-respect of human rights, widening gap between poverty and wealth. And sciences are crystal clear. The planet is warming, and this is clearly caused by certain types of humans' activities. And Europe, at this actual rate, will not hold their 2000 tar 2030 targets. Today, it is obvious that Europe has defaulted its promise of a parallel growing progress and has delivered to its young generation two incompatible GPS navigation system. Economic growth on the one hand and a carbon neutrality society respectful of the planetary boundaries on the other. During this conference, we will hear experts stating that those two tracks are not compatible. The daydream of green growth, made possible by decoupling economic growth and greenhouse gases, is over. And that is why the younger generation stood up 
all around the world, demanding to their nation to fulfill their political duty to protect citizens from the announced dangers. They rose up with Greta in Sweden, Luisa in Germany, Camille in France, Martina in Italy, Dominica in Poland, Selma in, De in Denmark, Anuna and myself in Belgium, and many, many, many others that are probably in this room today. From Nordic pine forests to the icing mountains of the Alps, from the rural basin to the Mediterranean coast, they carry the same chorus line. It is time to lift our nations from quicksand of unlimited growth to the solid, hard rock of inclusive prosperity. But these youth refuse to believe that the geographers of these GPS will not pay attention to the IPCC warning. They refuse to believe that the mercators of the Union will lead to their fleet out of the planetary boundaries. They refuse to believe that the democracy and peace guards are forgetful of their descendants. And that is why they are still mobilized today. There are those asking the, cl the climate and social activists, when will you be satisfied? We can never be satisfied as long as the planetary boundaries are not considered as a horizon not to be exceeded for the good of humans and living organisms intertwined. We can never be satisfied when our, as long as our economy is not organized around human prosperity and ecological stability rather than a constant accumulation of capital. We cannot be satisfied as long as Europe does not recognize its historical responsibility, not only in the CO2 stuck in the atmosphere, but also in the exploitation of resources from countries that are today mostly suffering from the consequences of climate change. We cannot be satisfied as long as the climate crisis is not seen as a fundamental challenge for our democracy and not as an easily bypassed rock thanks to technology. The technology model is seductive like the science for Ulysses. It tells us that we have the possibility, thanks to human genius and technological tools, to organize the world to our will. But this narrative contributes to political inaction and does not pass the science test. We cannot be satisfied as long as policies remain inconsistent. Fossil fuels is still subsidized, and all companies continue to prospect and drill new wells. Industrial and intensive agriculture is still being imposed. We cannot be satisfied as long as European leaders demand. We cannot be satisfied as long as words and actions remain that dissonant. I have come here to remind Europe of the fierce urgency of now. This is no time to abandon the youth on the shore of eco-anxiety, nor is it the time of giving them misleading maps of the future. I have come here hoping that those days will stimulate new narratives for Europe. Now it is time for Europe to adjust its original wish of protecting its citizens from self-destruction, accepting that self-destruction takes the form of war, of war, but also the form of Anthropocene. Now it is time 
to consider seriously the interwoven causes of the several crises, climate, energy, migration, security. Now it is time to redefine prosperity and renew indicators accordingly. Inspired by those who include education, healthcare, well-being, and many more. And inspiring those who still stick to the GDP as their monocular indicator. Despite timid and insufficient tremors in view of stakes of the climate emergency, despite CO2 still increasing, despite many financing and implementing projects destroying land, species, and people, I still have a dream. I have a dream, like many other youth. It is a dream deeply rooted in the European and democratic dream. I have a dream that moving away from the business as usual model of infinite growth is possible for all European nations. I have a dream that our political institutions will break the illusion of autonomy and omnipotence of humans and that they will rethink democracy in connection with nature, living creature, and respect of all human communities. I have a dream that Europe will, re will revitalize our democracies by increasing and widening citizens' participation, developing debates and decision spaces, because the transition needs a collective boarding. I have a dream that solidarity will remain the core of the European Union, building a fair and socially viable transition. And from dream to narrative to debate to policies, I hope this conference holds a torch to draw new maps for Europe, feet rooted in this loving earth and eyes on the end lighting starts. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Adelaide. Thanks to all three of you because you have shared, I would say, both gravitas. Uh, we are in a life threatening situation, but hope that we can do something about it. And I think that's, uh, that's probably the key message that I take from this session. I, well, in the interest of time, I really wonder whether we have time for interaction right now. I think a lot of things have been said. And we will have three days to interact, actually, during the sessions and uh, in the corridors, the big corridors of, uh, of this parliament. But one thing is certain is that uh, I remember, when, well, 20, maybe 30 years ago, I remember seeing the movie Terminator 2. <laughs> and I was struck at the time by the opening sequence of that movie, in which a totally destroyed world is, uh, is uh, how should I say, it's basically a, a battle zone where robots, killer robots, are actively hunting human resistance and these killer robots are owned by the owners of capital. And you might think it's an allegory, but actually at that time, while well, killer robots didn't exist, maybe the threat of human destruction was not yet uh, or planetary destruction was not yet clear. But actually, when I think of it, this is clearly a possibility. Collapse into barbarism. 
That's what we are facing. And sometimes I hear people saying, yeah, but you should have a positive narrative. Uh, but acting on reality, in my view, starts with seeing reality, including seeing the risks that we are looking at. And then we can have hope. But hope cannot be blind. Hope cannot be blind to reality. And indeed, one of the strong, or should I say, forces for human action is the will to live, to survive. And I think that is what can drive us out of this quagmire. So I would suggest that we keep it at that, uh, because I must to finish at uh, half sharp.